Hi, my name is Ian Castle. I'm the founder of microcapclub.com. I'm also the chief investment officer of Intelligent Fanatics Capital Management. And joining me today is Michael Liu. Uh, he works with me at Intelligent Fanatics Capital Management. He's also a microcap club member, and he's been investing in uh, microcap stocks for, for many years. And uh, with more and more investors looking at microcap companies, you know, one of the questions that Michael and I get asked quite often is, you know, how do we research a microcap stock? And it, it's a great question, and it's but it's a hard question to answer. You know, but you know, with talking to Michael, I thought we were both up for the challenge, so we thought we'd put this presentation together, and it's really a, a high level overview of how to research a microcap company. And the purpose of this presentation is to give you kind of a starting point in developing your own research method. You know, investing is a highly personal endeavor. You know, stock picking is as much of an art as it is a science. You know, you shouldn't look to clone what I do or Michael does or what any investor does. You know, the goal is to learn from successful investors, learn from your past experiences, and then iterate on that to develop your own process and a strategy that's unique to you. You know, but before we get started into getting in the nitty gritty of our research process, some people might be asking, you know, why microcaps? Microcap companies are the smallest public companies in the world. They make up about half of all public companies. The differences between microcaps and large caps like Apple and Google, it's no one's ever heard of these small companies before. But microcap investing has been around since the beginning of the stock market. In fact, you know, great investors, the best investors ever, like Warren Buffett, Peter Lynch, Joel Greenblatt, and many of the best investors ever started as microcap investors. Companies like Walmart, Amgen, Intuitive Surgical, Monster Energy, Netflix, even Berkshire Hathaway, all of these great businesses, some of the best performing stocks of all time were once microcap companies. So this is a vetted investment class in microcap investing, you know, where outsized returns have been made for decades. You know, and microcap is very similar to small private equity or venture capital. We're, we're all investing in small emerging companies. They're all small businesses. The difference with microcaps is they're public. You know, they're all accessible to you, the small retail investor. You know, but maybe most importantly, you know, I believe microcap investing is probably the only area in public and private markets where the small retail investor has an edge over institutions. You know, the small retail investor holds the advantage, not the institutions. Most of these small microcap companies are too small and too illiquid for institutions to be able to buy them. You know, institutions can only buy them after the business is mature, the management teams execute, the stock goes up, the liquidity and volumes in those stocks go up, and that allows those institutions to take a position. You know, so the discovery of these companies, these small microcap companies, really starts with you. You know, the, the smart money is the retail investor. And the institutions are the dumb money because they have to wait to buy them until these stocks go much higher. In fact, I would say the power of microcap investing, the discovery of a small microcap company kind of happens in waves. It starts with small retail investors finding them first, then large retail investors finding them, then small institutions finding them, and then finally, large institutions finding them. And unlike, unlike private equity, or especially venture capital, where you know, if we're all being honest with ourselves, you know, you have to have gone to the right school, you have to know the right people. Um, you know, you're not going to get the great ideas. You're not going to find Facebook or Meta early on. You know, the companies, venture capital companies like uh, Andreessen Horowitz or Benchmark or, you know, insert name of venture capital companies, they're going to be investing in these companies early, not you, a small retail investor. If you don't work there or if you don't go to the right I Ivy League school, you're not going to invest in those companies. But with microcap, it's completely different. The whole ecosystem, every company in microcap is accessible to you. You know, you aren't kept outside the gates of opportunity like you are in venture capital or private equity. You know, microcap is the opposite. The institutions are kept outside of the gates. And it's really the small retail investor's duty to find these great companies when they are small, because only you can. Microcap investing is not without risk, especially if you don't know what you're doing. You know, it's important to remember microcaps are small businesses. Some microcaps wouldn't even be the largest business in a small town. 
when you look at a small business failure rate, you know, really across the United States, about 20% of small businesses fail within the first year and 50% of small businesses fail by year five. So you see failure in microcap companies as well. When you start out investing in microcaps, you're going to lose money. I learned microcap investing by losing my money, making it back, losing my money, making it back. You know, but that's how you learn. There's no step-by-step -step guide to making money in microcap stocks. There's no DVD series or webinar series or lecture you can uh, you can listen to that will completely eliminate the risk of investing in microcap stocks. But my best advice I can give new investors that are new to microcap investing is to focus on profitable businesses. You know, this will cut out 90% of the issues and 95% of the headaches investing in this ecosystem. Roughly 15% of microcap stocks are profitable. If you're a new investor in microcap investing, first focus on analyzing those 15% of profitable real businesses. Before we go into researching microcap stocks, let me give you a 30,000 foot view of how microcaps are different from large caps. There are around 20,000 publicly traded companies in North America, and about half of them are small microcap companies. Analyzing a large cap company versus a microcap company is very different. Large cap companies are normally more complex. You know, on the left side of the, the screen here is General Electric and all of their subsidiaries. I mean, good luck diving into General Electric. You know, on the right side is a typical microcap company. You normally have one business that is selling only one product or two products or a few products. They might have a subsidiary or two, but it's all very simple when compared to analyzing a large public company. I mean, can you imagine analyzing all of GE's business units, analyzing the leadership of each business unit, the competitive analysis for each one of those 83 business units? No thanks. You know, that isn't a game I can win. You know, let Morgan Stanley, let Goldman Sachs, let JP Morgan play that game. Microcap businesses in general are much simpler. There are normally just a few important metrics or KPIs to understand and follow. You know, microcap is a game that you can win. Here's a traditional research report on a large cap versus an investment thesis on a microcap that we have on microcapclub.com. And this isn't to say you won't have 50 pages of due diligence when you look into a microcap, but when you write a thesis, you should be able to consolidate that knowledge down to a page or two. Here we compare the stocks of a large cap like Target versus a traditional microcap. You know, notice the, the market capitalization. Target is a $75 billion market capitalization versus the micro cap, which is $51 million. Notice the volume, the amount of dollar volume of shares traded on average. Target trades over $500 million USD of stock per day versus this micro cap, which is $42,000 USD per day. Many microcaps are small and illiquid, and this prevents the institutions from owning these stocks. And this is also the opportunity. If this microcap shown here executes and the stock uh, goes up, the liquidity will increase and allow institutions to enter. Also, notice the amount of analysts covering Target, 39 analysts. You know, Large caps have many analysts covering them. They're mostly held by institutions, and that just means it's harder to get an edge. I mean, Target's owned by 1,900 institutions that control around 85% of the shares. Microcaps have little to no institutional following and little to no analyst coverage. And even a lot of times the analysts that do cover micro cap or small cap stocks really don't know the businesses that well. So this is maybe the most important point on this slide. Since no analysts cover the stocks, many micro cap stocks, you can't depend on analysts for your research. You have to do your own independent work and research. You have to build your own independent conviction. I'm somewhat biased, but I think microcap investing makes you a better investor because it forces you to do the work. It makes the losses a pure learning experience. There is also no one else to blame. You know, similarly, the wins are much more gratifying since you earn them. Before you start researching a company, you need to understand the basics of accounting. Accounting is the language of business, and you can't expect to succeed unless you know that language. If you don't have an accounting textbook laying around, and even if you do, I'd encourage you to read this book, Financial Intelligence. It's, a, it's great for any experience level. Once you have the basics down, you can dive deeper and maybe take a course on accounting or a couple courses or, or whatever you want to do. Just educate yourself on it. But accounting is crucial 
when you invest in the stock market, when you invest in any type of business. And so I know back when I was in college and then into grad school, really the only courses, I probably shouldn't say this, but usually the only courses that um, I really still apply today are my accounting courses. Okay, let's uh, let's now get into the good stuff. You know, you're, you're thinking to yourself, I like the idea of microcap investing. I understand I should focus on profitable business. I understand the basis of, account, of accounting. You know, now what do I do? How do I find them? How do I research them? Where do I go? Who should I follow? What landmines should I look out for? You know, to help, help answer these questions, Michael and I created the, the FAIR research method that I think will help you get started. And FAIR stands for Find, Analyze, Interact, and Research. And we've kept this very simple. You know, I think both of us could have made this a much more detailed, granular presentation or method, but I think that would be counterproductive because the more detailed we make this, the more we would be influence you, influencing you to invest the way that we do. And quite honestly, the way I invest, the way Michael invests might not be the best way for you to invest. Investing is very personal, and a big part of becoming a successful investor is letting your learnings and experiences take you down to a path where you can develop your own strategy that is unique to you. So with that in mind, we've tried to keep this fairly simple for that reason. So let's get started. So the first letter in the FAIR research method is F, and that stands for find. You know, where do you start? It can be overwhelming. Uh, like I said before, there's 60,000 public companies worldwide, and half of those are microcaps. There's 20,000 public companies in North America, 10,000 are microcaps. It's a big sandbox. How do you start is probably the question I get asked the most. Microcaps are small companies. They don't have analyst coverage. They aren't being spoon-fed to you by Wall Street here in the U.S., by Bay Street up in Canada, the Lao Street if you're in India. You know Those machines aren't pumping these ideas to you. To be honest, the question, how do you find ideas, is a very difficult question to answer because you first need to know what you're looking for. Are you a deep value investor? Are you a growth at a reasonable price investor? Are you an inflection investor? Are you a hyper growth investor? Are you an investor that's focused on oil and gas or on a specific industry? Depending on the type of investor you are and what exactly you're looking for will impact how you find them. But regardless, I think there are a few main ways most investors find ideas. And we'll talk about each one of these generally. I know everyone is expecting me to say that Microcap Club is the best right resource to use. And yes, I believe Microcap Club is a phenomenal resource, but it's one of many tools that you'll use to source ideas. Whether it's brute force, whether it's screening, networking relationships, everything is driven by your own curiosity. I find finding ideas for me personally, it's like how a spider builds a web. The spider can't catch a fly by singling out one fly. It makes a web and it waits. It's the same for finding ideas. You need to build out your web through brute force, through screening, through networking, through relationships, and you need to be diligent keeping after that web. Eventually, something will hit your web, and then you can go see what you caught. So now I'd like to hand things over to Michael, who is one of the best finders of ideas that I know of. He's extremely talented. And I'll let him take you through the first two methods of finding ideas. Thanks so much, Ian. So to get started in the first step of our four-step process of researching microcap companies, uh, before even finding the company, like Ian said, you have to know what to look for. And everybody's investing style is different, like Ian has been saying. Everybody has different strategies. The, and each of these strategies has different things you're looking for. If you're looking for high quality growth businesses like Ian and I, then you're looking for you know high quality management teams, a long growth runway, good, good uh, business financials. But other investors do just as well doing very deep value of very low quality companies at even lower prices, or activists in special situations. In which case, you're looking for governance structures and you know board of directors and shareholder based setups and things like that. So the best way to figure out what to look for in the beginning stages of researching a microcap in your respective strategy is to read the case studies of successful trades and investments in that space. So this can be on you know, microcap club, like Ian mentioned, or Seeking Alpha or Value Investors Club, or anywhere, even, finance, even fund manager letters, where people have talked about successful investments that they've had in the past, 
or have even real time written about investments that they've been making that have gone on to been big successes. You need to look for the characteristics that predicted the successful investments and trades that these uh, individuals have made in the past and look for those variables that you know you can look for today in companies that you're researching today to then find companies in these different strategies that will be successful in the future. So to get into a couple of our different methods, broadly speaking, finding companies, different strategies is a trade-off between being comprehensive and being very specific. The most comprehensive strategy possible to look for new ideas is what we call the brute force method, which is basically to look at every single company out there. 10,000 microcaps in North America, you look at 10,000 microcaps in North America. This is what Warren Buffett meant when he said that his preferred strategy of looking for companies is just get a list and go from A to Z. The benefit is that you will definitely run across every single one of the best investments in the world. The con is that you have to sift through a lot of junk in order to get to that. And you could, you know, it will take a lot of time. I mean, if you spend a minute on 10,000 companies each, then you're going to have to spend 10,000 minutes to look through every company comprehensively. So it's very tedious, you can lose attention, and you just can't allocate that much time or thought to each individual company. But, you know, if you have the motivation and the time, and a lot of people do, this is by far the best way you could possibly go to look for good potential investments. And besides going just A to Z with a comprehensive list, there are some um, other ways to go about the strategy. For example, my preferred way to look for through every single company is to look through press releases and 10 Qs every quarter, which means that every company that puts out a 10 Q or a press release on their earnings, you'll have eventually looked through every quarter. So effectively, every quarter or two, you'll be looking through every single company, microcap company out there. But it allows you to look at things in a more dynamic way where you're looking at what has changed with these companies every single quarter instead of just going A to Z one time in a cross section because microcaps are constantly changing and evolving and you want to stay on top of that. A more specific way of looking through and finding great microcap companies is by using a screener. A screener is just an online tool and there are some examples on this web on uh, this slide that we'll be posting that you can use. Um, a screener is just an online tool that aggregates data and you can put in variables and parameters, and it'll give you a list of stocks that fit those criteria. For example, you know, revenue growth, market cap, what have you. A screener is basically, the value of a screener is in how you use it, right? You can make screens very, very specific or very, very broad. So here are some examples. You know, a broad screener is a great combination with a brute force method. For example, we have here a market cap of less than 100 million in profitable companies. That it gives you a very good list of companies that you can then go brute force through A to Z because there's going to be a lot of micro cap companies that fit that criteria, right? The issue with making, and it can be tempting to make a screen much more specific to find a really, really great company. The issue with doing that, for example, this specific screen here for a 30% ROE growth and at a low earnings multiple, it would be great if you could find that. But the issue is that those companies are probably over-researched and already known. So you're not um, finding too much new. What you want to do is not find the companies that screen well today, but rather find those companies that don't screen well today, but will screen really well in the future and might fit those really specific screens of high quality businesses in the future. And that's where the true alpha is found, at least in finding, you know, high quality growth businesses at, at higher valuations. The next way to find ideas is through networking. And networking can take a variety of different forms. You know, microcap investors, at least the good ones, are very independent thinkers. And a lot of times, you know, it can be uh, lonely and isolating. I mean, you would like to think of it as like we're all trying to find these companies that are very illiquid that barely trade and it's easy to kind of fall into this thought process that because they're so thinly traded that you're the only one that are that's even looking at these businesses but you know that couldn't really be further from the truth there there are a ton of microcap investors you know that are out there i mean microcap club is a good example of this you know when i launched the site back in 2011 you know it's I never knew that 10, 12 years later, we would still have, you know, 20, 25 investors trying to get into microcap club every month. 
And it's just amazing how many microcap investors there are. You know, but the but the irony is there are such few physical or virtual areas to connect with other microcap investors. When I was first getting started in the early 2000s, almost all of the dialogue and networking occurred on public message boards like Raging Bull, Silicon Investor, Yahoo Finance, Investors Hub. You know, and since most microcaps are mainly owned by retail investors, you know, this is just where investors congregated to share ideas and thoughts and to collaborate. And this is where investors built their reputations for finding and analyzing ideas. This is where I built my reputation was on public message boards back then. It's just a, it was just the place where you would connect with other investors. But over time, a lot of these public message boards and forums sort of died off. The conversations sort of shifted to private forums like Microcap Club or blogs, personal blogs or Reddit or Twitter or other places. But you know, nonetheless, you know, networking is is really crucial. You know, over time, you will build out your network, and over years and decades, that network of individuals you share ideas with will become your biggest asset as an investor. I know it's mine. I've been doing this for twenty years, and my biggest asset is the network of of other investors that I talk to about ideas. You know, this networking can be a very important tool because you get to know a broad array, broad array of investors and also companies without really going out of your way to find them. And I find networking is a great complement to what Michael was talking about with brute force research. You know, some would say the cons of networking is that you aren't finding new ideas if you get your ideas from others. But what I'll say is a lot of times other investors don't even know what they have, or they might mention a stock to you that they never really acted on. Or they may mention a stock to you because it isn't in their circle of competence, but it might be in your circle of competence. You know, the benefits of networking far outweigh the cons. Many of the best investors I know share ideas frequently. So if we were looking into the areas of physical and virtual gathering spaces, you know, the first kind of on top here are physical gathering spaces. These are obviously conferences and, and other venues. You know, we have to mention the Microcap Club Leadership Summit. This is an annual event that uh, Microcap Club puts on every year. Normally, it's in Chicago. It's a small, focused, exclusive event. Only our community can attend. High signal, low noise. And then there's other larger events like LD Micro or Planet Microcap. You know, these events usually have several hundred people in attendance. They usually have 100 or more companies that present. Um, you know, these are... These, I would say, have a gravitational force to them where so many people and so many companies go to them that it sort of one, forces you to go and participate. And these are great events for doing so. There's also uh, events that investment banks like B. Riley, Roth, uh, Craig Hallam, other investment banks that are in, in microcap that they put on that are mainly geared towards their clients, institutional or retail. And then there's also events that Sidoti, which is a research shop, puts on or Markham, uh, which is an accounting firm um, and consultant group that puts on at least annually or biannually. The second, I would say, area that's a physical gathering space that I think is really, really good to attend is a company's annual shareholder meeting. I know Michael has been to several shareholder meetings of, of, of a small microcap, so have I. And you know, a lot of times, quite honestly, you might be the only investor at a company's annual shareholders meeting. But a lot of times, you'll there'll, there'll be two, three, ten, maybe even twenty other investors at a company's shareholder meeting, and it's really great because not only do you get to um, kind of talk to other investors that are in, involved in a company that you own, so it really helps with your due diligence process into that company. But you're naturally meeting other investors that kind of sim that that are, look for similar things because you're all invested in this company, which is this annual shareholder meeting you're attending. So it's a great place to network. There's also virtual gathering uh, spaces as well. Obviously, Microcap Club is one of those. There's an application required. We cover really global microcaps, uh, North America, Australia, Europe in particular. Small Cap Discoveries is a forum up in Canada that focuses on Canadian microcaps. Geo Investing does a great job focusing on US and Canadian microcaps. You know, t Twitter and FinTwit, that community is becoming a great place to, to meet investors, also find ideas, and obviously seeking alpha as well. You know, I'm going to hit on the, the last part of this slide first. Networking is something that is near and dear to me. And in the early 2000s, I met a mentor of mine on one of those public message boards I was telling you about earlier. 
and he had a big following and a, and a big reputation, a great reputation. And um, when I was getting started, I was following him and I was following what he was writing. And, um, you know, I really just wanted to reach out and get his attention so I could get to know him personally, so I could learn from him and maybe he could become a mentor. And I remember I, I sent him a message on the pro on, uh, through that, I think it was Raging Bull. I sent him a private message trying to get his attention. I got nothing back. And then I sent him another message and I got nothing back. And then I sent him another message trying to get his attention and I got nothing back. You know, finally I decided I would force him to reach back out to me. And you know, how I decided to do that was I knew the stocks he liked because I was following him on these message boards. And what I thought I would do is, okay, I'm going to pick out one of the companies that I know he owns and I'm going to really research this thing to death and find some exclusive public information about this company that I know he wouldn't even know of. And I'm going to post it on this message board so he would see it. And he would be so impressed by what I was doing that he would reach out to me. And sure enough, that's what I did. And he reached out to me. And that started a 10-year relationship with an amazing human being. So you, you need to work to deserve your mentors. You need to be an asset to people. You know, Don't always be taking. Provide value to people first. You know, the other rule of thumb is put yourself out there in the public domain. You know, start a blog, get on a podcast, post your ideas to Microcap Club, let people know you exist. Supercharge serendipity by sharing your ideas. I've had a lot of people reach out to me uh, to talk about a specific stock because they, they heard me asking a question on a company's earnings call, or they heard an interview that I did on some other venue. You know, maybe you Maybe you heard somebody pitch a stock and you also did some work on a name and you had a few questions. I think I think you'll be amazed by how friendly people are when you reach out and want to talk to them about a specific company. I mean, we all like to talk about what we own. You know, the worst thing that can happen is you reach out to someone that you want to reach out to and talk to and uh, you know they don't respond or they burn your house down. Yeah, that's a joke. But I would encourage you to put yourself out there, post your ideas. Put yourself in situations that show off your potential, that show off your abilities. Reciprocate and show value to other people. Build your network. This will become the most powerful asset that you have as an investor. So now I'll hand things off to Michael to talk about analyzing companies. So the next step of our four-step method is once you've found a company with the preliminary variables that you think are interesting, you need to analyze the situation further. And this is all of the 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 meat of analyzing a company and getting to know the business better and looking at the financials and all of that. And we'll be going over that in the next few slides. So the first thing to keep in mind is that researching microcap companies is a lot different from researching large cap companies. And the main reason is that there's a big information vacuum with microcaps. So large cap companies are you know covered by many analysts, as Ian talked about. There's a lot of reports on them. They have investor presentations, IR firms. You can talk to many people about the company and there's many articles written online. With a micro cap, not so much. There's basically nobody out there that's financially or you know, motivationally motivated to um, synthesize information about a micro cap company. So you know, they're not big enough or they don't have enough money to hire IR firms. They're not big enough to get analyst coverage and they don't give banks enough money to get banking coverage. This means that you have to basically do all of the research for a microcap yourself. You have to read every filing, every line of a press release, listen to the conference calls, maybe even ask a question or two. And that sounds daunting, but it's also a source of opportunity because you can get a real informational edge researching a microcap company by just reading and looking at everything that's public about a company that other people aren't willing to because they're used to being spoon-fed information from analyst firms and you know investor presentations with large cap companies. So the first step of researching a new micro cap company that you've found is to look to the negative because the large majority of micro caps out there really have no business being public. They're just, you know, not real companies shells, pump and dumps, outright frauds. This stuff is rampant in the microcap space. And looking out for red flags is a really great way to basically screen out a lot of the microcaps that seem interesting on at the onset. Because like I said, the vast majority of these businesses really are not investable at all in any shape or form. 
So some of the red flags that you can look out for are signals that, you know, it's a non-existent business. There's a lot of losses, no revenue or, you know, no cash flow conversion. Um, an another easy thing to do is to Google the company's name and the company's executive officer's names with the word fraud. And that will usually come up with all of the examples of wrongdoing that this company has been involved in, or the people have been involved in in the past. Uh, related party transactions are generally to be avoided unless you really trust management. And if not, there's just so much opportunity for wrongdoing with large scale related party transactions that it's easier to just categorically ignore them. They're companies that are involved with them. You can look up the company's auditor on the PCOB website and look at the other companies that they audit. And if the only other companies that they audit are, if they don't audit any other companies, or if the only other companies they audit are like shells and frauds and stuff like that, then you should be wary of putting too much trust in the financial statement of the company that you're researching. Pump and dumps, story stocks, messy capital structures. These are all things that over time, um, most micro cap investors just learn to categorically ignore because nothing can, nothing good can ever come of these, these companies that have large amounts of these red flags. Once you've tried to eliminate any red flags, which Michael's done a great job, you know, overviewing, you know, it's important to focus on what's what matters most and not get bogged down into details that don't matter. You know, some big areas to focus on when analyzing a company, you know, number one and, and most important is execution matters. You know, after you get done reading through all the past press releases, you know, quarterly annual filings, earnings transcripts, if they even have them, you know, you want to see if management's plan is taking shape into the financials. You know, number two, you know, leadership matters. You know, I love to bet on management that has had a history of success. It doesn't doesn't have to be success in a large company. You know, in fact, it doesn't you know impress me that much if if the person was the president at IBM or Google or something like that. You know, microcaps are small emerging businesses. So I love to see entrepreneurial success. I love to see that a management team or a bunch of people on the board have founded a small company and they grew it from a small company to a large one and had, had an exit. You know, I love to see that. You know, and also, you know, do you see a management team, you know, not just a CEO uh, where there's really no one else around them? Michael and I run into a, a lot of really, really small microcaps where, you know, it's basically a glorified hustle. You know, it's one or two individuals that, you know, are hustling to make, you know, take something from zero to 10 million. And so the question is, are they really going to develop a management team around themselves to be able to scale a business to 100 million or 200 million or 500 million? We also like to see that, you know, that, that they have skin in the game. You know, do they own a meaningful stake in the company? I, I never want to invest in a business whose management doesn't have to live with the consequences of their decisions. The next thing is culture matters. You know, if you want to assess the strategy of a business, you know, talk to the management. If you want to assess the culture of, the, of a business, you know, talk to the lowest level employee, you know, see if they love to work there. Would they go across the street for a dollar an hour or more? You know, the employees are the ones that interact with the customers in most cases. They are the real brand ambassadors. You know, great companies have great cultures where employees love the company. Find out if the employees are happy and why. Find out what is unique about this place where they're working. Number four, customers matter. Are customers happy? Are they raving fans? Um, number five, you know, balance sheet matters. You know, can the business survive a calamity? You know, we run into a lot of micro caps that quite honestly, they don't have a balance sheet. They have very little cash. They're constantly trying to raise money. They don't even have a profitable business. You know, and so the biggest worry there is they have to constantly raise money. They have to constantly dilute shareholders. You know, God forbid you go through a bad macroeconomic spell. Can they even survive? You know, and so it's really important that you're approaching the balance sheet as kind of the way to survive. You know, do they have the resources to survive or better yet be aggressive when their competitors can? Number six, and this one has a little bit of nuance, but share structure matters. You know, a low outstanding share count matters, at least to me. You know, having as few shares outstanding as possible is a benefit to a business and a management team that is executing. Why? Well, because when investors buy the stock, it will go up. You know, I like to only invest where there's only common shares. You know, I try to stay away from preferred stock or different classes of shares. You know, when there's just one class of common stock, everyone is treated equally. And that's why we like to see just one level or one class of stock. 
The lower the amount of warrants, the lower the amount of options, the better. The smaller and simpler the share structure, the better. This gives the common shareholder, which is you, the best chance at winning. Now, Michael will take you through how to dig into what matters. So broadly speaking, it's possible to dig a lot deeper into companies than you would think from the onset. So yeah, you can read the press releases, the filings, and the earnings calls. And like I said, that's, you know, will get you to know a company better than probably 95% of the other investors out there. But to really develop an edge researching companies, you have to start looking for um, what you could call like non-traditional sources of information about the company. So for example, if a consumer goods product sells products on Amazon, then you could track the number of new reviews every month on Amazon for an approximate gauge of how much product that company is selling. Or if you know that another public company or a large cap company is a customer or a distributor of a company that you're in, a micro cap that you're investing in, then you could read their conference calls and read their analyst reports and things like that to figure out end product demand for, for that micro cap that you're invested in. Regulatory databases are a great way to get non-traditional information because um, companies and the government are usually obligated to report certain pieces of information online, like business records and when the government gives out grants and things like that. And you can track these things online that these um, stakeholders are forced to put out, but that other people probably are not aware that you can even get this kind of information online. You could go to trade shows, you can read industry publications. You, the broad idea is to just figure out, you know, what are the key variables of a company? And just do some creative Googling and see if you can find sources of information around those key variables that other investors probably aren't aware of because they're not in the filings or the press releases or talked about actively uh, by the company. So some final thoughts about the second step of the our FAIR research process, which is to analyze a company. You have to be aware that you're going to have to comprehensively analyze every single company because there is not going to be information from third parties like animals reports or anything else out there to help you research a company. And this is you know, a source of potentially equally dread and opportunity and excitement because you can really develop an edge around these companies by just being really good at research that other people aren't able or willing to do. The first step is to remember that to look for the red flags because most companies are not investable. So it's a very easy way to screen out a broad array of microcaps by just keeping those red flags in mind and you know ignoring any company that has, has too many of those. Then you need to focus in on the variables that are important to the company based on your different strategy. The different variables are different. And you know we didn't talk about anything like broad financial statement analysis or anything like that, but because those things are better talked about elsewhere and, and learned and experienced. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, the most important thing I would say is that you want to get an edge researching the companies that you're focusing in on. And the best way to get that edge is to use non-traditional resources, like I talked about in the past slide, to find out things about the company from online, you know, publicly available information that allows you to understand the company quicker or better or more in depth or one way or another than other investors out there. Okay, the next part of the FAIR microcap research method is interact. And so when we're talking about interacting, you know, what we're really talking about is on the ground due diligence, going beyond the numbers and talking to people inside and outside the company. This might include, you know, talking to companies' management, talking to their customers, talking to their employees, conducting site visits, you know, scuttlebutt research. You've probably heard that term before. Interacting was what initially drew me to microcap 20 years ago. You know, the ability to actually talk to a CEO. You know, you can't, or at least I couldn't, I couldn't do that with a mid-cap CEO or a large-cap CEO. You know, I'm not going to call up Tim Cook and have a conversation with him at Apple. You know, but you can with microcaps. And since microcaps are small businesses, it's important to find out what types of people are running them. To find great businesses early, you need to find great leaders early. You know, businesses aren't spreadsheets. Businesses are a group of people aligned with a mission and incentives. You know, you want to make sure the entire business is rowing in the same direction. And interacting can add significant value to that due diligence process. Depending on who you speak with, 
you know, there are certain types of things you want to find out from each one, but thinking about them as a whole or holistically, even, you know, I, you want to verify that all the groups are on board with the company's strategy and that there are win-win relationships that will produce great long-term outcomes and partnerships. You know, during the process of diligence, um, the talking to each one of these groups, you know, you'll find differential insights. And differential insights is a term that Paul Lounsis used to describe those qualitative nuggets of information you accumulate by talking to the people around the business. 95% of due diligence is analyzing if customers and employees are happy and why. And your edge is that 95% of investors will not do this. If you want to have above average returns, you need to do what average investors aren't willing to do. Interacting is a contested form of due diligence. You'll meet a lot of investors, even very successful investors that never talk to management or do site visits or talk to suppliers or customers. You know, and some say that knowing management is really, really important, especially in microcap where management's decisions are significantly impact, impact the, the entire company, especially where really small microcaps where that CEO might wear a lot of different hats. You want to make sure you're investing with the right person. You know, others believe that management can spin any story and therefore, you know, it's, it's unreliable what they're telling you. They're just trying to sell you. And so they're not a real good information source. And I think there's truth to both sides of that argument. You know, this is why interacting with management is step number three and not step number one in our research method. You know, you really need to study the business and industry first before talking to management. The business is what should initially draw your attention. The execution on that business is what should initially draw your attention that fuels your due diligence process. If the business situation isn't exceptional, you don't go any further. You know, I really believe in what legendary investor Phil Fisher believed, and that's, that's that you should be 70% of the way to a buy decision before you even talk to a management team. You know, which means your raw due diligence, your raw information gathering and scuttlebutt you know, should fuel your decision. If you spoke with management first, their salesmanship, like we said before, you know, might influence you too much. The other bit benefit of doing a lot of front end work and letting the business kind of shape your decision first is that you'll know what the right questions are to ask the management when you ultimately end up talking to them. So when you talk to management, you're not necessarily looking for information but insights into how they see the industry shifting or their strategy. I love to talk to management about like sort of their three to five year strategy with the business. When you talk one year, that's like guidance. and They don't want to talk about it. But if you talk three to five years, that's strategy. I also like to ask about what past mistakes they've learned from. What do they think the company will look like, you know, and like I said, in three to five years, what are the key performance indicators or KPIs that they look to judge their progress and their execution? You know, some companies, some management teams don't just simply look at revenue, earnings, and other normal metrics. And you can choose to do this virtually or in person. In person can be really helpful because you can pick up on nonverbal cues. If you talk to a management frequently and consistently, you know, that type of conversation can be very helpful. If you talk to a management team every quarter, you know, you can kind of benchmark their answers against the last time you asked that question. You can also spot signs of their tone changing when you ask a question or how they answer something. And that can be a huge edge. I know it, it's been for me over the last 20 years. It's just having that constant interaction with management. So now Michael will take you through interacting with the company. Yeah. So there's, um, besides interacting with management, there's many aspects of the company itself that you can interact with being, you know, mainly the employees of the companies, the assets they have, you can, if it's a consumer goods product, you can obviously try the product. It's a really easy way to get uh, in touch with the company and sort of understand how their product works yourself. You can go to their facilities if it's a manufacturing company. Usually, if you go to a company's annual meeting, they'll give you a tour of some sort of their facility. And the annual meeting is also a really good way to figure out the headquarter dynamics of the company, which by that I mean, you know, how the management employees and directors all interact with each other. Are they on friendly terms? Is there contention? Does you know every employee in the company thinks that the CEO is just a rich guy, a rich snob that they don't want to work for? Stuff like that. You can also interact with the company's employees. Going to their facilities is a really good way to do this. You can also look at um, you know online sources for this, like Glassdoor reviews, LinkedIn. Broadly speaking, companies or employees that have been at companies for a really long time 
are probably pretty happy being there for a really long time and are also probably very uh, unique industry talents to have. And then teams that follow each other. This happens a lot in the microcap space. When one employee or a high-level executive comes from one company and brings along a whole team of lower-level employees with them, that generally means that that group of people was uh, were very happy with each other in their prior company, and now they want to start something new together in this smaller company. You can also interact with the company's business partners. So this is sort of understanding the company's place in the industry and their supply chain. This is more difficult to do because there is really no there's not a lot of precedent to doing something like this. It's not like the company's inviting you to reach out to management or they're inviting you to come to their annual meeting and talk to their employees and, and visit their facilities. This you sort of have to do by yourself. Um, you know, the broad idea is to talk to the company, the stakeholders around the company. So their suppliers, competitors, customers. Uh, there's not a lot of, like I said, traditional ways to do this. The easiest way is probably to go to one of the company's trade shows or industry events. Um, you know, any company usually goes to these expos or conferences every so often every year. And if you see a really big one coming up, it might be worthwhile just hopping on a flight, going to that their exhibit, and then talking to not only that company there, but like I said, all of the other companies surrounding them and their supply chain in terms of the suppliers and customers and the other competitors. This can turn up some very interesting differential insights sometimes. One time I had a competitor of a company tell me point blank that the company that he worked for was very, very sketchy and I should probably ignore it. And that was a good thing to know. Another thing you can do is there's a lot of uh, expert call networks out there where you they'll set up a call for you with other companies or executives in the industry. And this is a good way to get to know the industry. but um, the thing to remember with all of this is that, you know, when only talking to one person, they're not necessarily, and especially one lower level employee, they're not necessarily going to give you a holistic and accurate view of the industry. They really don't have to. They're not barred by the same regulations as the SEC does with management teams or anything like that. They can point blank lie to you. So it's important when going to these events and talking to experts that you Build up information not with just one conversation or one call, but rather, you know, get a holistic understanding of the industry and where the co company sits by synthesizing a lot of conversations together. Because just one person can really tell you anything and you have no way to verify it or not. The broad idea here is to verify what management has already told you, like Ian's talked about, and make sure that, you know, everybody in the industry sort of agrees with each other as to what makes this company unique. And that's, that's basically what you're looking out for, is what stands out about this company. You don't really have to go into a conversation with a competitor or a supplier or anything like that with a key ask in mind or a specific set of questions, because you're just trying to figure out what makes this company unique or not. And usually the competitors and other stakeholders in an industry will you know, tell you over time what makes this company unique. That's going to be the one thing that stands out about the company that you're asking about. So it should be relatively easy to get information like that once you start a conversation. So it's this is a difficult process to do because there's really no standard to do it. But interacting with a company can add a lot of value to your due diligence. And at least with microcaps, it is somewhat easier to do this because the businesses are simpler. There's less investors involved. And like Ian said, you know, this is one of the only spaces where you can go and call up a management team and actually have them talk to you as just a small retail investor. So it can be a big source of edge interacting with a company. But, you know, like I've been saying, there's no, this is an art and there's no specific scientific way to do this. Um, there's no scientific way to go about conversations, to ask any specific questions. It's all sort of based on what you're looking for at the time. The one thing that's probably worth remembering is the golden rule. You know, if you're friendly and open to others, they'll be friendly and open to you. Don't go to management conversations just asking about why margins went down slightly every quarter, last quarter, or something like that. You know, you want to make it so that the management team wants to talk to you. You should, you know, be nice and open, and they'll probably be nice and open to you and want to talk to you and want to take your call. And that's the most important thing, usually, is keeping up these relationships over time not just extracting one piece of information from one conversation 
that that you're going to have because ideally you'll be invested in these companies for a long time. So the last step of our four-step method for researching microcaps is research with the emphasis on the the re or the the continuation of it. So research is is probably better known as maintenance due diligence, but shame is not a word, so we called it research and it starts with r. And this is the research that and the maintenance due diligence that you do after you've purchased the position, assuming that you've purchased the company, to figure out you know if you should sell, you should buy more, if you should continue to hold. Ninety nine percent of the time, you're going to continue to hold. But it's important to to not just you know scrap all of the research that you've done right after you've bought a stock because you're not going to ride these things forever. Microcap companies evolve very quickly, and some die very quickly, unfortunately. And it's important to keep on top of that. It's the easiest done by far of any of these aspects of research because you already know everything about these companies now if you've analyzed them very deeply, looked for differentiated insights, and interacted with everybody around the company. You should know the company pretty well right now and know the key variables to keep track of. But a lot of people ignore this step because they you know, are more focused on the thrill of the chase of finding another idea. I am myself am, am definitely uh, do that a lot. But this is by far the most important step of the research because what you don't, what you own, what you don't own can hurt you. And the only thing that can hurt you is the stuff that you do own by going down. So you should really, really be staying on top of these things that you put all of your investable money into to figure out if the time is, you know, if it becomes necessary to sell them or to continue hold or whatever. And also keep in mind that uh, the key variables can change over the long term. It's not, like I said, microcaps are rapidly evolving businesses, and these companies are not going to stay the same forever, especially as they become bigger, entire aspects of the structure of a company changes. You know, they'll add new divisions, acquisitions, new strategies. You can't stay in the same strategy forever. Um, and as the companies get bigger, you know, too, the, the management level changes. The CEO becomes less and less important because the business is just so big that they can operate without him and her him or her taking on a day-to-day role. So you should be you know, expanding the breadth of the management team that you know and the breadth of the management team that you're, you're analyzing as the company gets bigger. Um, some examples of maintenance due diligence that you can do are basically just keeping track of those non-traditional variables and databases that I mentioned before. So you know, these are just some examples because every company will be different what their unique assets are and how you track those. But some examples of how you can you know, keep on top of what a company is doing over time is to track top line KPIs. So how many employees are there on LinkedIn? Employees directly correlate with revenues usually. The product rules, like I talked about, purchase order contracts from bigger customers or from federal databases. Like Ian was talking about, you can keep track of management tone. It's important to in interacting to develop this close relationship with management so that you can understand subtle changes in their tone and how that um, how that suggests that the business is changing going in the future. The unique databases can vary between different industries and different companies. Some interesting examples are Medicare or clinical trials databases for healthcare companies, um, federal grants, federal and state grants for government contractors are all filed. Court cases are all filed uh, by county or federally for every single court case out there. And that can be relevant for basically any company out there because every company is involved in a lawsuit from time to time, and it might be worthwhile tracking those. Um, there are very good sources for broader industry information out there, like, uh, like trade shows that I talked about, press releases from other companies in the industry. Large cap earnings reports are a great way to get to know the state of an industry on a real-time basis because they report quarterly and they report about 15 to 30 days before any microcap company reports just because of regulations. So reading large cap earnings reports from large cap players in a microcaps industry is a really good way of basically getting to know exactly what's happening in the industry 15 to 30 days before the microcap will tell you, you know, exactly what's happening in the industry and how that's affect them, how that's affected them. So in conclusion. The opportunity in microcap is that institutions can't invest in these small public companies until their stocks go up. You know, and this also means that you have to do all the work yourself. You're not going to be spoon-fed research reports. You know, most of these companies, you know, 99% of financial professionals have never heard of before. You know, you can't rely on anybody. You need to do the work yourself 
and you need to form your own independent conviction. You know, and quite honestly, that independent conviction is really the key to investing in microcap because it's that conviction that will tell you when to buy, when to buy more, when to hold, and ultimately when to sell as part of that maintenance due diligence or research, which is what Michael was talking about. You know, we're researching companies, it's a bit of an art and a science. You know, investors do it differently. You know, I kind of view our investment strategies, each one of us like a fingerprint print where, you know, a lot of people they might that fingerprint might look the same if you're zoomed out, but once you zoom in, you get to really see what those nuances are. And each one of us, you know, invests differently. You know, so I would hope that this presentation has helped everyone here at least form a general understanding of the research process into a microcap company. And the goal here really is for you to take what you want from this and you shape this into, you know, something that's truly yours, that's unique to you over time. You know, if you found this presentation helpful, you would probably find microcapclub.com to be a great resource. Uh, you know, microcapclub.com was a, a forum that I started in 2011. And it was when I was a full time private uh, microcap investor that I just wanted to see what other smart people in microcap, what they liked and why. And so the, the, the forum really has been around for over a decade now, and it's turned into a, to a great resource, continues to be a great resource for my personal investing because you get to see what several hundred really smart investors in microcap globally what they like and why. And you get to meet a lot of folks on the forum uh, virtually and also at our annual event that we put on called the Summit. And you know, if you're interested in microcap investing, there's a lot of educational content on our blog. And uh, we hope to see you on the forum. There's two, there's two ways to join. Uh, membership is free. Uh, you just have to get in on merit. You submit an application with which is a two to three page investment thesis on your favorite microcap stock. At the end of every month, all of our membership votes on the quality level of those theses. We normally have around 20 to 25 investors that apply to become a member of Microcap Club every month. Or for those of you that uh, don't have the time or ability to become a member, or maybe you have a compliance department that doesn't allow you to participate in a you know, message board, you know we have a subscriber uh, functionality that basically you can pay an amount of money to get view-only access of our forum, which at least allows you to, to view the conversations that we're having internally on our forum. Well, we hope you found this presentation useful, and we hope to see you at Microcap Club.